everyone. I'm so flattered that you're joining me tonight. Uh, the one thing that I do not tire of is talking about native plants and how important they are to our lives, what they do for us, how they work so hard for us, and how we can bring them to, to our lives. Uh, Edge of the Woods, we're 21 years young now. We're so proud of that. We're a retail nursery um, off of Route 100. We have an Orfield address, but we're above Fogosville on Route 100. The retail center is open. We open the 1st of April and stay open until the end of October. So our mission, my business partner and I have done this together. And our mission was to bring these plants to people and make them available for folks can, that can introduce these into their gardens and their landscapes in many ways. Because prior to what we, prior to us opening this, it was very hard to find plants that were native, that were being propagated and being available to the general public in a retail situation. It has grown tremendously. We, you know, we're doing all kinds of projects. The interest in natives has just gone overboard in definitely the last 10 years, the last five like a rocket. And rightly so, because it's it's an important should be an important part of our of our lives. They're, these are basics. This is the basic. You know, plants are the basic. So I would like to present to you my rendition of bringing life to your landscape by using native plants. So here in this picture, we think of these systems as ecosystems, which is not an unusual word for all of you. And it's a combination of the living and the non-living environments. So this is a very large landscape. I'll, I, I shouldn't tell you where this is, but I will. This is at Longwood Gardens actually in their very large meadow in September. Absolutely gorgeous. So we have to look at the big picture. We have to look at, just go beyond our small backyards, but we can stay in our backyard and have native landscapes like this. This is a, a small resident in Bethlehem, actually. These folks came to us about 18 years ago, uh, shortly after we opened and said, we want some flowers in our yard. I think we've done that for them. Uh, this, these pictures are shortly after we did the installation. Um, if you go by this house now, you'll see that th these gardens have become much bigger and more robust. So you can have a large landscape, you can have a small garden, and these plants still feel at home. And then what can, what, what happens? What does, what happens when we bring these plants? Um, we transform, we start the, the buzz. These plants start buzzing with activity. I would like to just share my uh, definition of native plants. The, the traditional definition talks about pre-European settlement, but it, it's more than that. It's, it's post-glacial evolution, things that have evolved together through soils and the hydrology and the climate, not so much the human interaction and how these evolve together with wildlife to produce communities of plants in our backyards, uh, what traditionally were our backyards. And through human activity, we have changed those plant communities tremendously and have introduced non-native plants to our landscape a bad thing. So Carol, if you want to bring me back, we can talk about invasive plants, but it's not near as much fun as talking about uh, native plants and what they bring to your landscape. So think of these plants as something that's been around for a very long time, but we need to really reintroduce them in many areas, especially around here in the Lehigh Valley, where they have been eliminated from the landscape. And I use the word landscape you, when we're talking about your own personal properties, we might break it down into small units called gardens. But I like us to think about the really big picture and how all of these 
gardens fit into the bigger landscape. So if we think about, these are all native plants that are on these pictures. And if we think about the things that attract us to plants, when you go to the store, when you go to a nursery, when you go to the park, when you go to Longwood Gardens, what is the what are the characteristics that attract you to these plants that make you feel really good? And the colors, the forms, the berries, the butterflies, all those things just um, help to, for us to identify with this landscape. And they, they can be all different sizes and shapes and all the birds, birds are huge, are very, very important. You're not gonna see a lot of birds because my photography is not that great to catch birds in motion. So you'll have to go out and observe them <laughs> a little bit more on your own. So if we think of what attracts us to our landscape, and then we think about what attracts wildlife, it's the same thing, the berries, the colors, the seasons. You see up on the upper corner, there's a winter scene. If our landscape looks the same in January as it does in July, we don't have any life in our landscape. We are not, we're not seeing dynamic, a dynamic system. Um, we're lucky in Pennsylvania because we have so much change with season. And some people think that this time of year, it looks so awful. But I think you need to look beyond the brown, start to see the green popping and the berries that are still there and the expectation of what's coming. But what attracts us to these plants is the same thing that attracts wildlife. And that's what brings life to your landscape. When you can start having other things besides just the human, the human element, the seasons of the year we just mentioned. So up on the top in spring, have you ever looked at the flower of a tree? The fla that flower is the flower of the sassafras tree. So many people really don't appreciate the sassafras tree. It's a very important key keystone plant. On, underneath it is the fall color of the sassafras. And then if you look at the summer, you see the black-eyed Susan and underneath it, you see what it looks like in the winter. So all of these bring different times of year. They, they give us a sense of place. They tell us, yes, this is where we live. We're in different seasons and we can anticipate these changes in the seasons because the plants are telling us this. You know, we can go out and buy watermelons in the middle of January. I think that's the odd, oddest thing in the world to, to be able to buy some of the foods that we can off season. Um, but I tell you, when it comes to our landscape, the landscape really tells us what season it is. This is one of my most favorite pictures. And you can say to me, Sue, you gotta be crazy. What, what's so special about this picture? Um, this is a white wood aster, a little tiny aster plant that poked out underneath the snow. And I would have never appreciated what this plant is doing for wildlife until I saw the prints of the birds that were picking the seed off of this aster. And I, I, a very simple picture like this really tells us a lot about the importance of all of our seasons. Um, so I, to me, I could frame this and put this on the wall because I think this so signifies Pennsylvania landscape. Now, we all know the monarch story, and here's the monarch in many different phases. Um, up on the one, the upper corner there, that's actually a mating monarch pair. I don't know how in the world I saw that, how in the world I got that picture, but it's very special. And then alongside is our milkweed, which is the plant that takes care of the caterpillar. And you see the caterpillar, the chrysalis, and the butterfly. So everybody knows the monarch story, and it's a very important story because of the habitat loss that we're hearing so much about. But we have to think about the fact that there are many other creatures that go through all of this metamorphosis in their lifetime as well. But let's look at, this is um, milkweed, and you will see this, the flower is so fragrant. Like if you put your nose up to the computer, you can almost smell it. It has the, the most enticing smell and fragrance um, 
Not so great for a cut flower to bring in your house because of the milky sap, but it's a gorgeous flower. You're not gonna see a monarch butterfly on here, but look at all the other insects that are using these flowers for nectar. So this milkweed plant is serving a very large, diverse population of critters. And I think that's so cool because when these guys are blooming, the monarch really isn't in Pennsylvania. It's not until the monarch comes back to Pennsylvania that it starts to lay its eggs and the caterpillar starts to eat these leaves. So there are several different kinds of um, milkweed that the monarchs go after, but it's a very specialized insect because there's the, it's what the caterpillar, the caterpillar needs to in order to live. This next series of pictures is so dear to me because this is where the human element comes in. So just watch. Okay, come on. <laughs> might need to hit, there we go. I had the opportunity to work with a bunch of teenagers and they wanted to spread milkweed seed. Some of them have never been in a field like this before. They were so afraid to walk into that field. But look at their faces. This is, this is the human element that native plants and plants bring to us. And isn't that just a pre precious picture of somebody enjoying the landscape on a very large scale. So we have to, we bring life to the landscape through the human element. And I'm sure you've seen this in the fall when all those little fluffy things start to fly around. If you look very, very carefully at this picture, you'll see the little tiny seed at, at the pitched point of all of those feathers. Um, and that's how we get new plants. They're planting themselves into the landscape by flying around and allowing those seeds to become part of the soil. So here's some other very specialized critters that we, we just don't see because they're so aloof. Um, these are the, the silk moths. I, the cat, the cocoon that you see down on the lower corner, just this last week, I found, we found, not just me, found several of these cocoons hanging on some trees. We went to, to go do some tree shopping at a tree nursery where we get some of our native or larger trees. And they were hanging off of black gums and oak trees. These are the cocoons. And out of that cocoon comes the moth. And that moth does not live for very long, but, and it wants to mate, that's its sole job. And it lays eggs. I don't have any pictures of the eggs here. And then the caterpillar emerges. That caterpillar lives all summer long, munching on all kinds of uh, native canopy trees. And the one above it are, beech, are birch trees. This is a sweet birch tree. And I, I have found these caterpillars on that kind of tree. Oak trees, sassafras, hickories, these silk moth caterpillars will need these trees in order to, to go through its life cycle. And then we all love butterflies. And I should have a picture of the butterfly that comes out of this crazy. Can everybody see the butterfly on the far right hand side of the screen? I um, picture my face is right in the middle of it so I hope you all can see it. This the giant swallowtail, the magnolia is a very very special plant and you see how teeny tiny people think that that is actually a bird poop and that little bird poop um, will mature into the caterpillar that you see on the far right. Now the plant that's on the far right is not the magnolia, that's actually a wafer ash um, seedling, and they were covered with these caterpillars in the nursery this past summer. So I hope you, I don't know, I'm a little disturbed that maybe I should change, that you can't, I can't see that caterpillar on my screen. <laughs> I hope you can, because my face is in it. 
um, this is how specialized these can be. And all of these plants go through the same kind of life cycles as that monarch butterfly does. And we forget about that. And we co concentrate so much on the perennials for pollinator plants that we forget that these woody plants are also very special in life cycles of these um, critters. So here, I, I promised you I would bring some life. This is the life. These are the things that enjoy all the plants that we spend so much time cultivating and bringing into our landscape. Um, everybody hates the gumballs that are on the ground right now, and they're going, whoa, 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 I have to rake those up. And I and now we're we see that there's sweet gum trees that don't produce gumballs. Well, if we don't produce gumballs, how is this chickadee going to find food? So do we need to have all the feeders? Um, feeders are really fun to bring the birds closer to our windows. But there's a lot of birds out there that need a food source that's not by your window. Did you ever uh, think about the mud puddle that you might have in your backyard and how the butterflies love to drink the water from the mud puddle? That's when you see kind of a gaggle, if you want to call it, of butterflies in a mud puddle, it's really pretty special. Up on the top corner with that little uh, red stripe on it, you may know what that is, you may not. That is the larvae of a ladybug. So that's what a ladybug looks before it becomes a ladybug. And that little larvae um, nymph of a ladybug eats more aphids than the ladybug beetle does. So those are very, so many people, oh, I've, we, we get so kind of anxious when people don't know what that is and all they want to do is go get the spray can. My my plants are being infested. I have to have to do something. I have to control these bugs that are on my plants. Well, if you don't see these critters, your landscape is dead, even if you have those purple aster flowers. But if you're not seeing these critters part of the life of your plants, then you have a dead landscape. Uh, the caterpillar is the painted lady. American, American, there's a painted lady, American painted lady, and that's on pussy toes. And they lay their eggs in there and they totally destroy the plant uh, until the caterpillars metamorphosize into the, the butterfly. And then the plant comes back and you have a whole new plant to enjoy. So you can, you can see I like the critters that are come to our gardens. Um, on the top, that is a ladybug larvae um, turning into a lady beetle. And that's what it, the cocoon before it turns into the beetle. Um, we have the horned horned caterpillars. Those are those turn into those hawk moths that, that they look like almost bumblebees or they look like moths and they buzz real fast and, and you probably have seen them. Um, if you have perennials around. And in the fall, the garden um, spiders are, they just make, they do wonderful things. I have found spotted lanternflies in the webs of these spiders. So they are predaceous. They are doing a great job for us and we shouldn't be afraid of them. And I did get a, uh, oh, 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 oh. Now I'm I'm I all of a sudden lost the name of that bird. I, where's Barbara Malt? She is such a great person to <laughs> talk about birds. But um, this this bird is pretty unusual. And I was very excited to see it sitting on my deck, and I got a picture of it before it flew away. So here's another unusual critter. This guy that's my kitchen. He flew into the house through an open door, and landed on the counter. And the plant that I have right outside the door is the Virginia creeper, the Virginia creeper vine. So many people want to get rid of their Virginia creeper, but this is the kind of wildlife that uses these kinds of vines um, to, to really give diversity to all the living parts of our landscape. So 
and and that it's not a small flying sphinx moth. It's not small. It's probably got a good inch across from from tip to tip. And you can see the uh, you can actually see the blue berries that are on the Virginia creeper vine and wonderful food for birds in late fall. So here's just another fun. Take time to see this. This was a Washington hawthorn filled with robins in February. And this was in the middle of Emmaus. That the the uh, let's see, let's see. Oop, I wanted to see if I could go back to it, but I'm not. I guess I can't. <laughs> it's not. It's not going back. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, there it is again. I just love watching this. Um, there are overwintering robins that will come in. So what's so important? These berries that are on this hawthorn. They're not juicy. Nope, too much noise. <laughs> the berries that are on something that's around in the wintertime, like the winterberry hollies are, are so full of starch and proteins that birds need to overwinter. So they don't, they're eating seeds, but they're also eating those really hard berries that are hanging on to the trees and shrubs in the wintertime. So if we really want to take away some of the lawn, what are our alternatives? We get calls all the time here at the nursery to say that they really want to reduce their lawn. And this is one of the alternative, a very small little meadow. And this is not big. And you can see the lawn on either side of the yellow um, black-eyed Susans that there is grass and is cut. This is actually in my backyard. It's this this little meadow has changed quite a bit because it has um, many new introductions of plants that have come into this meadow. But so we have this this obsession with our lawn that we need to have green lawns. We can't have any kind of uh, weeds in our lawn. Uh, it becomes a monoculture, becomes one solid green mat that isn't providing any kind of good to anybody or anything. So how can we change that? How can we change? How can we be, do real subtle little things that like this that can change um, what our landscape looks like? And made, yes, when my when some of these things went into our property, at our house, my husband said, I think it takes me a little longer to mow now because I'm mowing around so many things as opposed to going back and forth and back and forth, you know. So a lot of people sometimes will not add these elements to their landscape because they think um, it's too hard to manage. But we don't need to control this stuff. We just need to enjoy it. Again, this is a button bush. This, bu this button bush of fragrant blooms in the middle of the summer when nothing else is blooming and it gets to be a shrubby tree. And so you're, you're bringing a great source in the middle of the summer. This poor little guy looks like it's had, a, had its wings clipped a little bit. It's probably on the end of its life cycle as a mature butterfly. Um, but I, I can't stop showing you pictures of what you can invite into your landscape in the most subtle way. You're not going to, I was at the Allentown Flower Show a little bit and they had the butterfly house and everybody was going in this butterfly and all these butterflies are flying around. And, and that's just, yes, it's wonderful to be able to put one of those little critters in your hands and stuff, but you don't normally see that intensity of butterflies flying around um, and, and it'll be mixed with some bees and some other insects that are flying around these plants besides just the butterflies. So right now I just want to show you the beauty of some native plants, some of the grasses, mixed borders with lots of color 
And this, this kind of thing, you don't need butterfly bush. Butterfly bush is not giving anybody anything. You put plants that have a variety of flower time in your garden and you will do everything that a butterfly bush will do for you. This is a uh, Joe Pye weed, not open yet. When that opens up, it's this big pink powder puff. And then we have cardinal flower, which um, hummingbirds really love those, those long tubal flowers that they can get in there and lick up all that nectar. And the butterflies go crazy over the lobelias. Then this one in particular is the cardinal flower. So, summer berries and spring berries you can this is a service berry you can see that this is a much more juicy berry um, so in the springtime we want juicy berries and give them lots of energy but we don't want that juicy berry that we see in the non-native honeysuckle that we have in the fall because that's the wrong time of year to have a juicy berry um, so our natives really put the juice and put the put the proteins and, and give all the right foods at the right time of the year. This um, on the trillium that you see in this picture may not have as much wildlife value, but it's certainly stunning. This is a monarch on ironweed. This ironweed is purple, purple, late summer. So you get something in the late summer. Uh, cone flowers. There's a couple different kinds of cone flowers. This one in particular is the Tennessee cone. Um, it has a little bit of more purplish stem to it. It's a little more wiry looking. So there's a couple different species of cone flowers that we sell here at the nursery. But the ones that are orange and terracotta and have mango names and they're hybrids. They they take the the insects and the butterflies and the birds. They see colors that that they know to have um, and and they're more in the grays from what i understand than they are in the brilliant colors that we see here but they <clears throat> um, when we change the color we change the shape of these plants and we change when they bloom we're also changing the opportunity for our native wildlife to find their food source. They can't find the food source because we've changed too much about that plant for the pure enjoyment of our visual aesthetic. It's, those are, are pure, purely for us. And we can get very excited about colors that we, I went to Home Depot last year, one of the, the box stores and saw all these different colors of cone flowers in this big arrangement. And I'm going, is anything going to really use that pot of flowers or is it just going to be an ornamental pot for us? Very, very early. They say when the columbine is blooming, the hummingbirds are back. So the humming, this is a very early flower and the, um, that comes into the garden <clears throat> is the columbine. I can't even show you or spend enough time explaining to you exactly, I'll give you pictures of everything that there is that you can introduce into your garden. There, natives can be very specific about where they want to be. If they like wet soil, you better put them in some moist soil. If they like dry, dry soil, don't put them in water or close to wet soil. They're, and all of the labels, everything that we do here at the nursery helps people really to understand, to match these plants well with the, the landscape that they have. We try our best to really tell people how to match these. Lots of diversity, lots of color, bringing lots of different things into the landscape. And some people think that there's not much to pick from, but the, the number of plants, the species that are available to us are numerous. Yes, there's things that you'll repeat many times throughout your garden to unify everything because you can't always put everything you want. Like some of the blueberries, blueberries that we eat, we go to the store and we buy blueberries. They're not always the easiest to grow in our gardens because they like, very, like a very acidic soil. And if you have a lot of deer, the deer like them too. And that's a whole nother talk too. Like, what do we do with the deer in our garden? 
So there's many, many topics that go along with the idea of how to grow a native garden. Um, but blueberries are a native plant. And um, it's um, so one of the things that's really, really new in the in uh, planting is to have multifunctional landscapes, landscapes that are feeding us, that are edible. What what are some of our edible natives? And that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> On the, the right hand side is um, clethra, very sweet smelling. I believe I'm not an expert entomologist, but I believe that's a honeybee that's on that clethra and not a bumblebee or not one of our other native bees. There are many, many honeybees. Um, honeybees are domestic bees. Uh, they have to live in a colony. Um, our native bees live uh, mostly solitary. The bumblebee is our native bee that lives in a colony, but every other bee that's native usually is a solitary bee. So we confuse the fact that um, bees that give us honey for, for the pleasure that we get from the honey um, is an agricultural product. And honeybees are, are raised to give us an agricultural product. This is, Dan, this is at the Lehigh Gap Nature Center. And this is the blue lobelia. Um, I have to tell you that this stand has changed a whole lot over the years. These lobelias move around. They're a little unpredictable. Uh, they drop their seed and you're not really sure where they're gonna come up the next year. In the back, the pink are swamp milkweeds. So those are a smaller milkweed than the big milkweed I showed you earlier. Don't forget the woody plants. Um, we have flowering dogwood. This happens to be a pink flowering dogwood. Behind it is a plant called a silver bell. And it's so gorgeous when it's in flower. Sweet shrub, um, there's many, many people that remember sweet shrub from, it's an old fashioned plant, so they say. And fafagil, I just wanted to give you some pictures of plants that really can be aesthetically pleasing for, to us, but also have a higher purpose. Our native Pachysandra on the far left, and that's when it's in bloom. It has some characteristics of the Japanese Pachysandra, but um, its bloom is very different. The color, it's a little more subtle and soft. We have bottle brush grass. So the grasses, the big grasses that you see, those big heavy grasses, um, many of our native grasses are much more soft. They, they have a more soft characteristic to it. And then there's the honey, trumpet honeysuckle. This is, if you want hummingbirds, you get a nice um, a trellis that's going to be big and sturdy and it needs some sunlight to give you these flowers and those flowers will open up to some beautiful flower for the hummingbird to enjoy. We forget about witch hazel. This witch hazel blooms in uh, the fall actually. It, it has an October bloom and these little spidery like flowers. So what in the world would go after these the, and they smell so delicious, very citrus kind of smell to them. Um, but there are lots of insects that use these flowers. Your butterflies, not so much anymore at that time of year. There's a combination of things going on on the other side between a fall, this is a fall color, the winterberry holly and the fall color of a flowering dogwood. And the white flower there is um, white snake root which is very prominent in our landscape, moves around a lot. Some people love to hate it because it can um, really be pretty dominant in people's landscape, but it's a great fall flower for um, butterflies to gather up all their energy that they need, especially um, monarchs that use it for migration. Isn't this a gorgeous little picture? <laughs> so the bottle gentian, it's all closed. And how in the world, what in the world is this little bumblebee doing? It's just so magical what, how these, these critters, these creatures can use these plants to the best. They, they poke a little hole in, these bot in, in the bottom. What, what he's doing there or she is doing there is making a little hole so they can obtain the nectar that's inside. Sometimes you'll see these bumblebees actually worm open up, force open those little bottles 
in and and get down on the inside of it which you could sit there in your garden and watch forever um, this is a great fall flowering it's a september bloomer which is you don't always see things like this in september and some other plants that are really great for the shade um, the heuchera these the, the there's a sedum that likes dry shade and this is what the native hydrantia looks like. So we planted this perennial garden years and years ago for this client. And yes, it has just gone a little crazy probably. It, what used to be five little separate uh, perennial gardens is now one big garden with a little bit of walkway between them. But in the middle of the summer, this is what you have. And what you see when you're there, these are Joe Pie weed, the cone flowers, there's um, some uh, Agastache, which is a mint in the background. So you want, you want your landscape to be full, fill it up. Then you won't find the weeds. You won't worry about the weeds when you fill up your landscape with plants like this. And then you leave it all up in the winter time and let all those critters enjoy all those stems and all those seeds from the top of those cone flowers, they pick it apart and they just enjoy all the seeds. So sometimes people get a little anxious with natives because they are a bit unpredictable. And when I say unpredictable, it's because they survive in our gardens, many of them by producing seed. Some of them, like the, the obedient plant that you see in the middle of this picture will have put on runners and it'll run around in your garden but then you let everything else kind of seed in between it and then you get this great combination it almost looks like it's in a flower vase doesn't it um and and the colors that you find this is what wildlife likes they want this combination they want these little places they can hide and find food um Natives are very reactive to the environment. They will tell you if they like it there or not, whether they'll set down their seed and grow for you or not. So we are working, all of us, you and I and our nursery, are working very hard to bring these kind of landscapes to life. Sometimes it doesn't always work. Sometimes we get a wonderful result. A lot of times, most of the time, but it's unpredictable what might happen sometimes. And we have to learn to understand how these landscapes can be a bit unpredictable. And then how do you maintain them? Sometimes, you know, you can let them be, don't fuss too much. You could go around, pick up, you know, cut off some of the, the um, things that are falling over or if there's a, a weed in there that bothers you, but it does, it's a whole different kind of maintenance than um, when, you, when you allow these things to grow together and they take care of themselves and they support each other. So you don't have to stake them and things like that. This is the unpredictability of natives. So these um, biennial black-eyed Susans kind of swallowed up one of the seats we had here at the nursery one year, because it is dropping seed and coming up again in a very unpredictable pattern. So you can find this happening. We did not rescue this chair. We didn't want to rescue this chair. We will put out a different chair for our customers, but we didn't want to change uh, what was happening at this moment. And these are just two examples. Uh, the white wood aster, which loves the shade and the, the um, the polka dotted monarda or bee balm, they have to drop seed. They have to be able, like the, the picture of the in the snow, this is the flower from that picture in the snow that the birds went after, that this is the white wood aster. <clears throat> so we need to see seed drop in order for them to persist in our landscape. Now I wanna share with you about the people part that plants give us. Um, if you take the leaf and you, if you take all three parts of this and you stack them on top of each other, can you see that? Put the leaves on top of the middle and put the roots down on the bottom. This is a birch tree and an oak tree that are living side by side very carefully. Look how the roots just wrap around each other, how they need each other. These plants um, 
So I couldn't take a, a good picture to represent the whole tree because it's 100 feet tall. So I broke it down into three pieces. Ecosystem services is how do plants serve people? And, and what do they give us as a, as a people besides the wildlife? And sequestering carbon is huge. We hear about this all the time, sequestering carbon. And these trees are working hard to clean our air and to make things smell good. So sequestering carbon is one of its ecosystem services that we get. These plants clean our water. They give us clean water. They recycle nutrients. They, they help to, you've probably, many of you may have heard about riparian buffers. A riparian buffer is a planting on the water's edge that helps to keep all those fertilizers and anything else we put in our lawns out of our water systems. And how can we keep our water clean and pure? And how can we keep the storm water from overwhelming our rivers? So these riparian puffers soak up this water, they infiltrate it, they get it down into the soil with their root systems, they clean the water, they protect our water systems. And then in this, uh, a bit of a rain garden you know, on the right-hand side, and with layers that we put into our landscapes help to keep our soil and our land cool. There's nothing like standing underneath a tall tree. You can feel the difference when you're in the shade. So reducing heats, reducing um, pollutants, these are all the services that we get from our plants. How are we doing about time? Oops, I gotta get going here. So um, pollinators, 80% of our plants are pollinated by animals. We, and this is our modern age. There's another one of those great silk moth caterpillars. But pollination, huge. Pollinators helping, the, they're helping the farmers that we have around here give us great food because they're adding to the opportunity for pollinators. So Doug, can you read that? I'm hoping that my, my um, face is not in the middle. <laughs> Of, of this, of Doug Talame. Doug Talame is a gentleman. He's written several books, Bringing Nature Home, and there's many resources out there. But he's telling us we have to stop. This is not butterfly bush. This is a phlox. Um, people think this is butterfly bush. This is a phlox. Huge, huge uh, pollinator plant for butterflies and bees. And Doug Talame is telling us we have to stop thinking about the pretty and thinking about how it supports us. That's what the quote is all about. Look up Doug Talame, look up one of his books, read it, it'll give you tons of information. And so what do we get by planting natives? We get diversity, we get seasonal interest. I am gonna have to, uh, we get habitat, we get change of seed, we get biological pest control, and we get a much more interesting dynamic landscape. And we, we can leave this alone. We don't have to be manipulating this like we think we have to have our hands in here all the time. So diversity, biodiversity means everything from the critters, the bugs, to, to the wild, to the plants. Um, the more diverse your landscape is, the more you'll have a stable environment. And here's another one of D uh, Doug Talame's quotes where he talks about 40 million acres of lawn, and I'm sure that number has gotten even larger. Farmland is really important for us to have food, but some of our abandoned farmland is still covering over half of our country. So are we using our farmland wisely? Because um, before European settlement, especially here in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was, was a woodland. So, Oh gosh, I'm, I have to, my, there's my cursor here. I'm trying to get rid of the, no, wait, ah, no, I didn't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> so um, as I end this, this is what, why do we do this? And you'll see, 
some words for you to think about. Um, why do we do this? We look this to restore our land. We do this to add diversity. You've heard that word so many times tonight. We do this to support our wildlife. We do this to support habitat. We want to be more um, conservation minded. We're thinking about the climate. We're thinking about those ecological services that plants and native plants in particular give us. So this is why we do this. This is why Edge of the Woods does this. And that's the end of my talk. So Carol?